This is Ruth O'Reilly, and I'll give a little bit of my history as I grew up. I was born on March the 4th, 1919, in a little house out in West Cove. Uh, it's about a mile west of Highway 95, just as you head up the hill uh, called the Viola Hill. And we were in the little house with no electricity, no running water, no bathrooms. We had kerosene lamps and outside toilets. And uh, our clothes were, well, they were handmade. Everything we had was handmade. We were rather poor. We had no income other than a little 40-acre farm, which was nothing but Canadian thistles. So we were very conservative and very frugal. My mom and dad, at least, I don't remember too much about that. I was pretty small. My dad was born in uh, New York, and uh, his father had come from England as a stowaway on a ship. And his mother was in, uh, from Australia in New York at the time when he met her. And they married, he brought her out west, and uh, she never saw her parents again. They farmed, they were at, in the Willamette Valley for a good many years, and uh, worked very, very hard. They raised what they called teasels, and they had hops for malt for brew, and te these teasels were used for combing wool. And they had uh, a warehouse, long, long tables with women sitting on each side using little knives with about a two-inch handle and a two-inch curved blade that they trimmed these teasels. And then they were packed and shipped to the factories or to the whatever. But my dad worked very, very hard. He was made to wear shoes that were too small for him, and he was pretty well crippled all of his life. My mother was born and raised at Kendrick, Idaho, and uh, she pretty much put herself through school and went to normal and was a teacher. And she taught, uh, well, she taught at East Cove for one time, and she taught around what they call stites. She met my dad out at East Cove School. They had a dance, and uh, that's where he met her, and it ended up they were married. In those days, we didn't, uh, well, the mothers never went to hospitals to have their babies. They had them at home. And the three of us were born on this little farm I was mentioning. And some, I guess, was Jim O'Reilly's, my husband's sister, uh, was with my mother when one of us was born. I'm not sure which one of us, but... Anyway, the doctor had to come out from Pluse if they came, and that was about a, a six, seven mile trip with the horse and the buggy. Uh, we later moved to, from this Canadian thistle farm to a farm over by, uh, well, it was a crossroads out of uh, Potlatch, about five miles, I guess, on Highway 95. Uh, across the road from where the Lindsay place is. And that from there is where I went to school. We had uh, some pretty hard winters those days. We had snow that would cover the fences and we'd walk across the fences uh, over the tops of all these fences because it would have firm ice storms or rain and they'd freeze on top so we could walk on top. I can remember uh, our lunches freezing in our metal lunch boxes. We had, at school, had a big pot-bellied stove. Of course, the teacher at that time had to go to school and, and get the fire started and, and uh, get the water thawed so they could have some water to drink and wash hands with. We drank from one dipper and we all washed from the same little basin of water. 
when we were wet, our clothes were hung around a big old pot-bellied stove and, and to dry, and then recess, we'd go outside and get them wet again. They'd hang by the stove till noon and on through the day. She'd try to have them dry for us when we headed for home after school. We had an outside toilet at school, and uh, the one room was eight grades. And when we'd have a class, she'd call the class to the front of the room where we sat on a bench. And uh, we would go to the blackboard and uh, do our spelling, our arithmetic, and that sort of thing. That's where the classes were conducted. It was quite a teacher that can control a whole room of 20-some kids and have all the subjects and, and have them all pass at the end of the year. They had to take state exams. and. We had to go to Viola to take these state exams, which was four miles, and we walked over and we walked back, which was quite a trek for in those days, but we didn't think much about it. We were pretty young. To go on to high school, uh, I had to stay out because I was uh, one year between eighth grade and high school because I was started to school when I was five and I got out pretty young out of eighth grade so I stayed home one year because at that time we had to pay uh, all of our books pay for all of our books and any school expenses we had supplies pencils paper and all that so the district Our entertainment when we were young, uh, my parents belonged to the Kennedy Ford Grange and we literally grew up there. I think we were there uh, every other Friday night for a Grange meeting. Uh, we There was a big long kitchen alongside the hall and we kids would all play out in the kitchen and and uh, till the meeting was over and then they usually danced afterwards and that was the height of our glory was the dancing part uh, the little ones when they got tired they ended up in a in bunks in the back room and uh, they were all covered up with everybody's coats and when everybody was ready to go home they grabbed them all up in the coats and put them in their cars and went home they were open touring cars in those days so it was pretty blame cool but we be all fresh and, and ready to sing if we had been sleeping, so <laughs> we'd sing all the way home. But those dances were our lives, and then every other week they would have a regular dance down there, and uh, the orchestra might be somebody that could chord on the piano or play the piano and drums and uh, whatever instruments people could play, a violin and maybe a horn or whatever they happened to have. We had lots of square dancing, which is was much different than what they do now, but some of it is familiar still for what they are doing now. But I can remember when the old Riverside Hall was there, there was a Riverside Hall over by the river. As you go by the Kennedy Ford Grange Hall, you went over this uh, trestle or bridge and turned left, and it was up alongside the river. And we used to have celebrations there, and, and I can remember Peerless Dentist coming down from Spokane with all of his dentistry stuff on the back of a truck, and he was supposed to be the peerless, painless dentist, and he would entice people to get up on this truck and have their teeth pulled. You'd be surprised how many did that because it was free. <laughs> The, they did that anyway, and we had a lot of foot racing, which we all entered and uh, delighted in. I can remember winning a prize on a broad jump one time, and I had jumped 10 feet, and I didn't even know what a broad jump was. I just entered because everybody else did. Come to find out, I'd won a prize, but I'd vacated the premises at that time. They had quite a time running me down to give me my prize. I didn't even know what I had done. Then when they built the other Riverside Hall, I guess the first one burned. I, I'm not really sure on that. Then they built the other big round hall that it was known as. And uh, the Kennedy Ford Grange sponsored uh, celebrations down there on the 4th of July, 3rd, 4th, and 5th. So my folks would hurry up to get the hay in, 
somehow or another, we always had warmer weather, and our hay was ready before the 4th. But we'd hurry up and get it in so we could go down and celebrate for three days and three nights. Mother was secretary bookkeeper of all of that, and so she they made sure that we got there at 10 o'clock in the mornings for all the foot races and the baseball games and the carnival and rodeo or whatever went on during the day and then at the night at the dance why that went on till one o'clock or so and then time mom got through bookkeeping and dad was working in the kitchen and so time they got through we'd get home about four but we were sure up by 10 o'clock the next day for the for the day of the fourth and this day of the fifth then we'd all conk out on the sixth but those were big celebrations and big days for us kids. We always were going to dances. My folks loved to dance and they had regular dances at Riverside and if I didn't have a date, my dad would make sure that I got there. He'd go down and go to work and if I didn't show up by a certain time, he'd come home and get me and make sure I got there. Mother used to go and sit along the sides and kind of keep track of dances that I would promise ahead so I didn't teach somebody or, or anyway, she kind of helped me through all of those. I sometimes would rather go without a date because I could dance with everybody then. I didn't date a lot because I, well, I don't know. I dated after I was, we couldn't date till we were 16 years old. So I, I did date a few, but not all the kids had cars in those days, so sometimes we'd just meet them at the dance, and then that was our date. We'd meet there and then say goodbye and go home with our folks. That big round hall was really quite an attraction for uh, people to come and dance in the area. Many, many times there were full crowds, like 400, 450 tickets sold, and that would be singles and couples combined, which would end up being around 800, 900 people in there. Then eventually, uh, because of floods that went through that hall so many, many times, they uh, started having roller skating out there, which kind of wrecked the dance floor. But they had roller skating for all the kids for a long, long time, which was a, certainly an attraction around here. Then they just flooded so badly one year it washed the hall 18 inches off its foundation and it was cabled to trees up on the hillside but because of all the destruction from that they had to destroy the hall which was a really heartbreaker for the people in the community because it was a center place of big entertainment when I was in high school uh, my dad got arthritis really, really bad. So uh, he was going to have to quit the farming. And my mother had taken an exam and passed to get into the uh, post office here in Potlatch. And she got the job and she went to work under uh, Mrs. Renfrew, I believe, was probably the first postmaster she worked under. Uh, there was a Mr. Balch. I can't remember, just, I think he was maybe before Mrs. Renfrew. But uh, she had a, a car that, uh, I think that was about the first closed-in car that they bought, and Mom went back and forth to work and from the farm. And one winter, she got snowed into Potlatch and uh, couldn't get back home, so Dad was out there by himself. And it was so bad, he had to shovel himself to the barn to milk, he had to shovel himself to the pigs and the chickens and shovel his way back, and he was pretty well isolated for three weeks. Those were days when the snow rotary plows would go through and blow the snow, well, looked like miles high, but we had more snow and harder, much harder winters then than we do now. I don't remember an awful lot about potlatch because I didn't go to school here. I remember the big old mercantile. I can remember distinctly those oiled floors. I was always so impressed with the wood floors being oiled. Uh, the departments were always a delight. There was everything, that every department that you could think of in that store. Uh, 
upstairs the furniture and they had meat market and groceries and men's wear and women's wear and drugstore and jewelry and uh, pottery and hardware and shoe department there's just everything in that store the post office was uh where now the building is owned uh, by cone and it's where he has his offices for real estate it was uh a laundromat, there were apartments up overhead. There was a firehouse right next to the post office. And then there was a telephone office where the old switchboard operators worked. And then there was the big hotel. And then there was a, a from that, that's where the bank is now, the hotel was. The confectionery was up that street called Pine Street. And it was where the Excel store is now, only that it opened up on to Pine Street instead of going down below where Excel opened. And I can remember the hospital building uh, is now vacant, I think. Uh, I think it just sits there. I, there is a lady living in it, I'm, I'm told. Um, on the upper side of that street, there was a bakery. There was a a moose hall we used for moose hall meetings and I went upstairs over that building one time I think it must have been a boarding house there were tiny tiny little rooms no bigger than a, a twin bed could sit in and maybe a chair and a tiny chest and a little tiny closet and there were well, like 18 rooms upstairs I always shuddered when I saw those rooms I thought oh I'd hate to be up there in one of those, but I guess if you're asleep, it wouldn't have mattered. Then I can remember the theater, which was on the east side of that street. Uh, I don't know what all went on there, but people who can remember that theater would tell you. But I remember going to shows there, and my husband said that he, when he was in high school, they had a play that they put on in that building. And then there was a library there. And I can remember Mr. Gambetti having a barber shop in the, on the north side of that hotel building, on the corner part of it. Uh, just several things I can remember, but there are people who lived here that can tell you much more about that than I can. At one time, there was a big red barn that sat down by the river on the mill grounds where the potlatch force had a horse barn and down in that same flat was a, a football field because my husband played football field football when he was a senior when he was in high school on that field and it seemed to me like there were gardens down there that the people residents of the town had used That's pretty much my knowledge of, of Potlatch. Um, not going to school here, I was not that familiar with it. Mother being in the post office was my only experience of being in Potlatch. Um, I will go back to where I was in high school. I graduated from Plouffe High School and went to Northwestern Business College in Spokane. From there I uh, went to Moscow to work in an agricultural office. I absolutely hated Moscow because I I didn't fit in with the University of Idaho. I was not connected with anything up there, and if I didn't uh, work there, go to school there, or have some association, I was bored to death. So I took an exam, civil service exam, to go to Washington, D.C., and I passed, and I went. Then in Washington, D.C., I was, well, we did a lot of traveling and looking around and seeing things, and I was there when World War II broke out, which was quite an experience. I was at a football game, and they called all the Navy Army officials out of the football game, and everybody wondered what was going on. Well, when we got to the taxi to go back home, he told us, we lived uh, seven blocks from the White House, and 
could not go by there or near there because of the people packed around it. We detoured seven blocks, no, six blocks to avoid the people to get home. Uh, that night, the Japanese burned all their paraphernalia in their yard up in the northwest and they had a big chain link fence around it and they sat in there and laughed at us with that horrible laugh that they had at that time which just was very hard to take. I had uh, taken a trip to New York and uh, I had a friend from Palouse that uh, at that time was living with me in an apartment. We took this tour to New York and uh, going up on Coney Island, we got to see the convoy that was forming out in the ocean. Uh, Roosevelt claimed that there was no convoy being sent. Well, we knew better at that time. I worked for the Veterans Administration there as a secretary taking shorthand and transcribing. And then it got to the place where they were going to freeze us to our jobs. So uh, I didn't really want to be frozen there. I still was writing letters and very much in love with Jim O'Reilly. So I couldn't get a release to come home. So I just came home anyway. I uh, then went up to Fort George Wright in Spokane and uh, they're really bad. Well, that was for 2nd Air Force Headquarters, which was the number one priority, and Veterans Administration was the number two. So he was able to get me transferred to a number one priority. So then I went to work in, in uh, the personnel office there at 2nd Air Force Headquarters. My main job was taking histories from uh, people applying for work that they had the fifth columnists at that time and we had to dig and dig and dig to get the history of anybody that was going to work there. And that was pretty hard because they wanted the addresses and where they, what kind of work they did for the past previous 10 years, which was nearly impossible to remember. But we did our best to get the information. Well, then my mother was very, very sick with cancer, so I just quit my job there and came back to Potlatch. I was engaged to Jim O'Reilly at that time, and uh, I didn't care much whether I was in Spokane or in Potlatch, because I was going to wait for him to come home anyway. Mother passed away in 1943, and then Jim came home in 1945, and we were married, and we lived uh, with Dad out on Highway 95, the junction of 95 and Highway, I guess it's 6 going into Princeton, the junction out here anyway. And then uh, two years we lived with Dad, and then we moved into a, t a house up on Elm Street. In 1952, they sold the houses in Potlatch, so we bought the one up on Cedar Street on the South Hill, where I reside now. My husband passed away in 1995, so I'm here by myself.